Well, let's take our Bibles tonight. Please turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And we're going to do things a little bit differently tonight for the Lord's table. I'm going to share just a few minutes from the Word of God. And, and uh, then I'm going to turn the service over to Brother Roberts. And he's going to lead us through the Lord's table tonight. And so I'm just going to share a few thoughts from the Scripture to prepare our hearts about the love of Christ. And uh, I, I said to him, I'd like you to take the Lord's table. I'd like to learn how you do it. And just to see... Uh, what he did for 30 years up in the Sioux and like to learn. And then we talked a little bit and realized we both learned from the same guy. So it might be the same, <laughs> but anyway, that's okay. You know, we learn things throughout the years and I like to learn from Brother Roberts and so uh, it'll be good tonight. And so I'm just going to share a few thoughts from the Word of God to prepare our hearts. And every, every month I try to take something, just, so just one little thing, just one thing if we can to focus on. Uh, about the Lord's table, whether it's the blood or the body or what. Tonight, we're going to talk about the love of Christ. And uh, you say one little thing. That's not a little thing, is it? Uh, we just heard a song, uh, the champion of love. His weight outweighs the world. I mean, talk about the love of Christ is a, a never-ending topic, but we'll try to narrow it down just to a few verses tonight. First John chapter 3, if I were to ask you, what verse would you pick to describe the love of God I think many of us would say John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave. That's the most famous verse, the most well-known verse. But maybe the second verse would be this one. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear that we shall be but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What a wonderful promise. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Heavenly Father, for the next few moments, we want to focus upon your love for us. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that it would provoke us to love you more. Help us, Lord, to understand that this relationship that you ha have uh, given to us through Jesus Christ is that we might have a mutual love for one another. Lord, we cannot possibly surpass the love that God has for us. Lord, we see it in your creative hand. We see it in your provision. We see it in your daily bread that you give to us. And we see it in, even in your chastening, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Lord, every moment of every day, we, if we are honest with ourselves, we could look to something and say, God loves me. So Father, I pray, Lord, for just a few moments tonight, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table and what Brother Roberts has prepared for us, we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to focus on this singular thought, the love of God that is expressed to us throughout his word and how it surpasses anything that we could ever know on this earth. Father, bless us now, we pray, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name, amen. You know, sometimes I, I get a kick out of young people. I was a youth pastor for a few years before I became a pastor, from about 1994 to 1998, and dealt with all, all kinds of young people. You know, and it, always, it was always funny to my wife and I when a 14-year-old girl will say, but I love him, you know? You know what saddens me today is that we see young people break up with a boyfriend or a girlfriend and then they end up in a hospital harming themselves, or sometimes even worse. And the truth is, a lot of times they don't even understand what the concept of love is all about. But I'm thankful that we understand from Scripture what God's love is all about. As a love that was sacrificial. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And then the next few words he says, I am your friend. Not a wonderful passage of scripture in John 15. We understand his love because of his sacrifice. We understand his love because of his gifts towards us, his spirit. I'm so glad that he said that it is expedient for you that I must go away, that another may come, another comforter may come. I will not leave you comfortless. And we have the Holy Spirit of God within us and we have him filling us and walking with us and providing for us day by day. We understand it because of his sacrifice and because of his spirit. We, we understand his love because of his, his provision in our lives. 
Aren't you glad that you can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me? That we want for nothing, that if we simply seek first the kingdom of God, all these things shall be added unto us. God has provided for us in such a great way. We lack nothing because of the love of Christ. There's a lot of things the world could take from us today, but let's be honest, do they really matter in the light of eternity? If they took your very health and your very life, you would open your eyes in the presence of Christ. There's some things that the world can never take away from us. The Bible puts it this way in Romans chapter eight, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. What a wonderful promise of scripture. Neither life, nor death, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come. And on and on the author goes when he says, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. I want you to see some things here tonight in 1 John chapter 3. And I may repeat a couple of those scriptures because I had them written down later on. But 1 John chapter 3, we notice the Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. I see four things quickly tonight that I'd like to point out to you. Number one, I see a portrait. I see a portrait. You say, what is a portrait? Well, a portrait is a little bit different than a picture, isn't it? A picture it might be a photograph. How many of you have got your uh, photograph of yourself in your wallet? Nobody? How about your driver's license? Right? How many of you like pulling them out and showing them to people? Well, I love those passport photos. A picture. They're, they're just terrible. They make me take my glasses off. My wife literally looks at my health card and she says, the only thing missing is the nickels over your eyes because I look dead. I look so old on there. No glasses and saggy and wrinkly. Boy, quite the help meet, huh? But a portrait paints a greater picture. It's something that we are to look upon. And notice what the scripture says. He says, behold. The word behold is, is used many times throughout the scriptures. But the, the word underneath this word behold is a little different than some of the others. This one is only used a few times in scripture. This behold literally means for us to, to take a gaze. It is an imperative meaning that it is not to be avoided, it is, it is to examine or to gaze upon, and we are not to look away. The Bible uses this word another time in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. To behold is to behold a thing of beauty. The songwriter put it this way, look to the Lamb of God. But the Bible puts it this way, behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. It's one thing to look at a picture, it's a whole nother thing to behold the beauty of a portrait. And as we think about the love of Christ tonight, the Bible calls us to behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And so as you think of that word behold tonight, it means to not look away. God is saying, don't avoid this. Look upon it. When I think of John the Baptist crying out, behold the Lamb of God, I think he's looking right at Calvary. We are not to look away, but we are to behold what the Savior did for us. Now, not only does he say behold, but notice the next words, what manner, or what kind of love he hath bestowed upon us. And we think about that, we look to the scriptures, the Bible says this, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends. I want you to look at 1 John chapter 3 and look down to verse 16, if you will. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The author John is saying the greatest example of love is that you would lay down your life. And Christ laid down his life for you. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 18 says that you may be strong to apprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you may be able to fill unto all the fullness of God. As we look at this portrait tonight of the love of Christ, he's saying it surpasses your knowledge. 
We can see some of the brush strokes of the artist through the pages of Scripture, but we cannot fully comprehend his love for us. Oh, I hope that one day we can. Years ago, we, were, we had moved into our first home, and uh, we had a little condo on the West Mountain. It was a wonderful blessing that God gave us at about half the value of the home. We were able to pay for that. And uh, we were so excited to get our first home. We just had a young family at the time. And Austin was only three months old when we moved in. And we painted our living room and we cleaned the carpets and we did all the things we wanted to do to get it fixed up the way we wanted. And in our living room, we said, there needs to be a picture above that coach, something up there. We didn't know. We, we, weren't, uh, we didn't have much money or anything. We just scraped together all we could for a down payment and such. And, and so we thought, what are we going to do? We, we want to decorate. You know, you, you want to take pride in your first home. And so uh, when you know it, Zeller's was closing. How many of you remember Zeller's? Yeah? How many of you still got things from Zeller's? No, you don't because it didn't last more than a week. You know? And so we, we went to Zeller's. It was closing and they had this painting there. And they were selling it out for about 20%. I mean, it was cheap. And it, it was about the color we wanted, had a gold frame on it, and it kind of went with the light blue walls that we had. And, and, uh, and it had kind of a, a seascape, a sailboat on it. And, uh, you know, some of the blue sky and the blue water kind of looked nice. We thought that looked nice. And so we got that real cheap, and we put that up. And, and I got looking at it, and I said, Honey, do you know what this is? This is a Monet. It wasn't the original, obviously. How many of you know you don't buy Monet paintings at Zeller's? But it was a poster type print and it had been nicely framed. And, and uh, I began to look at that and look a little closer. And I, I don't know why, but I really liked that painting of that boat. And unfortunately, when we moved, it, it got broken. But, but we had that for several years while we lived there. And I, I remember looking at that for several times before I realized it was a Monet. And I thought, this is from one of the most famous painters ever. And I began to look, and they tried to capture some of the brush strokes. It was a little bit more abstract than I normally would like, but you could clearly see the, the ship sailing in the water and the sky and the clouds, and it was a, a beautiful portrait. You know, I was thinking about that today while I was reading my notes and such. I thought, boy, God has painted us a beautiful portrait. And just like that painting, we sometimes don't recognize the artist. I had heard the name Monet, I really didn't know much about him, but I knew he was a world-famous artist. You know how you get to be a world-famous artist? You have to die. You have to be dead. And he had died. But I had heard the name, and when I saw his name in the court, I thought, isn't that something? I've had that painting up there for a couple years, and I never recognized the artist. I just thought it was a Zeller's bargain bin thing that looked nice on my wall. How many times have we looked in the Bible and on every single page, God says, I love you. I love you. I love you. And yet we fail to recognize the artist. He says, behold. Don't look away. It's imperative that you understand that I love you. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. I see a portrait. I want you to see, secondly, I see a privilege that we should be called the sons of God. What a wonderful privilege. What a wonderful privilege. How many of you have ever seen, I was saying this morning, we've, we've got several families in the church that have taken people in or adopted or such. You ever seen one of those videos come across where a little, little boy or a little girl open a present and when they open up that present, there's a piece of paper or something that'll say, we want to adopt you. We want to be your forever family. You ever seen those videos? And the kid will start crying because they've been, they've been in foster care. They've gone from family to family over the years. And finally, a family has said, we want you to be a part of our family. Man, perhaps we've been so blessed and so privileged, we don't understand what that feels like anymore. But we've been adopted in the family of God. God, God is saying in this verse, behold, what manner of love I be, the Father hath bestowed upon us, and, and here's how he proves it, that we should be called the sons of God. That we get to be part of his family. 
What a wonderful privilege has been afforded us. These verses I, I shared with you this morning, but as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the children of God or sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. For as many as are led by the Spirit, it says in Romans 8, 14, by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. It's amazing to me that we have this wonderful privilege to be, so many say, well, we're all, all God's children. No, 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 no. That's a privilege afforded those who believe on Christ. Amen. And it's a privilege that is given by the love of the Father that we might be called his sons. But I see thirdly tonight, not only a portrait and a privilege, once you see a promise. Look at verse two. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Notice a twofold promise tonight. Number one, to be like him. What does that mean? Uh, Brother Eric, that, to me, it almost sounds blasphemous to say that I'm going to be like Jesus. I think of the Mormon cult out there tonight that, that says that we all can achieve Godhood. I don't believe that is what it means. But I'm thankful that one day, like Jesus, I'll have a glorified body. Amen. One day, like Jesus, we will be sinless. Amen. We will leave this body of sin Paul very plainly said this morning in Romans chapter 8 that if we walk after the spirit, we have life. But if we walk after the flesh, we have death. We are slaves to the flesh. But the good news is we're going to have a glorified body. I'm leaving this flesh behind. I'm no longer bound by this body of sin. And so like Jesus, I'll be sinless. No, I will not have the throne at the right hand of the Father. And no, I will not be the very king of heaven. And no, I will not. There's so many things that Christ is that I will not be. But I will be like him in that I'll be sinless and I'll have a glorified body. And I will dwell forever as a joint heir with Christ. Amen. And an eternal home called heaven. What a wonderful promise that one day we'll be like him. I don't know why anybody be scared of heaven. What a wonderful place. What a wonderful person. But then we see the part, second part of this promise. We can be like him because we will see him as he is. We sing that song, Oh, Praise the Name. And I love that phrase that says, My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. What a day that will be. Uh, Brother Eric and I were just talking this week about a blind evangelist that said, I, I have a, an advantage over all you folks because the first person I'll ever see is Jesus. He says, you want to give me a heavenly mansion, that's fine, but put a vacancy sign on it because I'll be down at the throne Amen. at the feet of Christ, worshiping for eternity. Yes. What a wonderful day that will be when I see Jesus face to face. So we see a promise. But I want you to notice verse three. We see a purifying, a purifying. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure, referring to Christ. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. What is that hope? I believe it's the blessed hope that we will see him again. The blessed hope is that the Lord Jesus Christ will come. The Bible says this is our blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in Titus chapter 2. And I believe that the apostle here is referring back to that time and he's telling us that there's a time coming when, when we will see the Lord Jesus Christ and we shall see him like he is. And every man that has this hope is purifying himself. You know, last Saturday... My wife and I were getting ready at the house, and we were, uh, she says, I got I to gotta jump in the shower and we, we're, before we go to prayer. And then next thing you know, um, Pastor King called. And he and his family were passing through, and he says, hey, we want to stop in for a few minutes. And we said, okay. Or he said, why don't you meet us up at the Tim Hortons or whatever? And so at first we said, yeah, that'd be fine. And so we, we made those arrangements, and then I realized my wife, she, she, wanted, she was in the shower and stuff. I thought, well, she needs a few more minutes. And so I, I called him back and said, listen, why don't you just come by the house? I said, that way my wife can finish 
getting ready, and I said, we'll, we'll order some supper or something for your family, and we'll have supper together. And so that's what we did. And so I said to my wife, I said, listen, I said, while you're doing your hair up and all that stuff, I said, I'll run down and I'll tidy the house. So she ran down and she started tidying. When you got company coming, I call it fluffing stuff. <laughs> you're cleaning up and you're throwing things in closets and corners. I mean, two years from now, we will find something in a cupboard we just threw there last Saturday. I guarantee it. But isn't that what you do? You tidy up real quick. And, and things weren't that bad, but there was, I'd been studying, and so I had some books out on the table beside my chair and my little laptop there for typing on the, on the footstool. And, and my wife had been doing the budget, so she had her clipboard out, and she had, you know, all, all, all kinds of things, you know. Dog toys were on the floor. And, and so I, we're fluffing stuff. We're cleaning up. That's what verse 3 is saying. Somebody's coming. Is your temple clean? Is everything in order? Because you're going to see him as he is, but guess what? He's going to see you as you are too. At, a man, at an hour when no man knoweth, he's coming. And his reward is in his hand for what he finds you doing. How will he find your house? I used to love an old gospel quartet and they'd sing, this old house. You remember that old, this old house? And he'd say, he'd say this, my house is in order, my bags are packed and ready to go. Are you ready for the Savior to come tonight? That's a promise that he's coming. And as a result of that, we are to purify ourselves, to make ourselves clean. You know, as we come to the Lord's table, the Bible says, let every man examine himself. And let me, tonight encourage you to examine yourself in the light of the love of Christ. Because if you have the hope of his coming, we ought to examine ourselves, we ought to purify ourselves that we would take tonight in a worthy manner. I'm going to have a word of prayer and I'm going to ask the men to gather at the front and then I'm going to turn the service over to Brother Roberts as he comes to lead us in the Lord's table. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love tonight. We thank you for the words of Scripture. Behold, what manner of love. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to take those words to heart. If nothing else, Lord, would we stop, pause, and remember how much you loved us. The Lord's table is a memorial service of your love for us. The Lord's table is a monument throughout the history of time. Looking back to the cross of Calvary, where your love was expressed, because greater love hath no man than this, and a man would lay down his life for his friends. So Lord, I th pray that as we examine our hearts tonight, we would be found in a worthy manner. Help us to make our lives right before you, that we might take the Lord's table in a proper way. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.